Hello, everyone, and welcome to my Gizmology from Home talk, Signatures of Dark Matter Interactions at High and Higher Redshifts. I'm Marcus Mosbeck. I'm a PhD student at the University of Sydney, working with Celine Bohm and Yvonne Wong. So on my talk today, we have three parts, essentially. First, I'm going to introduce the interaction that we will be basing the rest of this work on. Then I'm going to talk about the nonlinear predictions and compare to warm dark matter. Finally, I'll talk about how gravitational waves as a no can work as a novel probe of suppressed structure formation. So it's based on a work we did on the linear on this uh, interaction at the linear level and some what right now unpublished works that hopefully should be out around the time this talk becomes public. So a little bit of background so we're all on the same page. There's a lot of dark matter out there, and it clusters at least on large scales. We don't know what this dark matter is, but a lot of research has gone into constraining the possible parameter space of what it could be. So let's constrain it more. Let's find more things that it cannot be. We'll introduce this uh, simple phenomenological scattering model where we have a dark matter particle that scatters with neutrinos with non-zero mass. And it happens with a constant cross section. So it's not temperature dependent. Arguments in favor of uh, looking at interaction between warm dark or between dark matter and neutrinos is that neutrinos are still not completely understood part of the standard model and might be re related to new physics. Additionally, it's not something that's easy to test in a direct detection detector experiment because you can't just take a big tank and fill it full of neutrinos. So we parameterize our model in terms of this U uh, interaction strength parameter. That is because we have a degeneracy between our interaction cross section and our particle mass. So smaller particle mass means more dark matter particles, more scatterings, and equally, a uh, larger cross section means larger scattering probability, so more scatterings. So the current status of this model is that in the first paper where we investigated this, we used the cosmic microwave background and baryon acoustic oscillations to constrain it to a U chi parameter of less than 10 to the minus four. Then later, a different group followed up on our work, including Lyman Alpha, data, uh, which introduced a preference for a uh, smaller interaction that we uh, constrain, but actually a preference for non-zero interaction. These are both based on linear computations, though uh, it has been used to map to nonlinear Lyman alpha data, not no other proper nonlinear uh, evolutions of this model have been done as far as we are aware. So it's time to go to the nonlinear scales if we want to put stronger constraints on this. Luckily, for values permitted by the data of our interaction strength, then the model decouples at very high redshifts. And if you want to run nonlinear n-body simulations, you start these at still quite high, but significantly lower redshifts. So we don't actually need to include our interaction in the n-body code. We just use it to ride initial conditions. So when we evolve our uh, interacting model in the n-body simulation, we see this suppression at small scales, large k values. And, but the, but really this looks a lot like warm dark matter. So we can try to compare it to what happens in warm dark matter models. So at the linear uh, level, we see these characteristic oscillations uh, in our interacting models, while our warm dark matter models only have these uh, suppressions. So we can actually quantify this and tune our interaction strength to mimic these uh, one, two, three, and four kV warm dark matter models as well as we can. And we see that we can get uh, roughly 5% uh, mimic uh, up to the time when the oscillations become important. So 
if we evolve both of these uh, models, the warm dark matter models and the interacting models with an n-body simulation, we actually find that they look remarkably similar. We see that at late times, these oscillations that characterize the interacting models are completely washed out. And we see a suppression with the shape extremely similar to the one we see in the warm dark matter uh, cases. This is lucky because there's been a lot of work on how to constrain warm dark matter. For instance, it was found that the SKA through uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping, so essentially looking at where neutral hydrogen clusters at redshifts of set of, of three to five, it would be possible to constrain up to 4 keV in the uh, warm dark matter mass. When we look at our mimic interaction strength, this uh, corresponds to a 10 to the minus eight interaction strength, which is four orders of magnitude better than CMB and BAO, and two orders of magnitude lower than the value preferred by Lyman alpha. But does this mean we can never ever tell the difference between uh, warm dark matter and interaction dark, interacting dark matter? Hopefully not quite. So we perform, we looked at the very high redshift as well in these simulations, and we can see that at these times, the oscillations uh, that are present in the interaction scenarios are not quite washed out yet. So what you really need to do in order to constrain or, well, distinguish between warm dark matter models and interacting dark matter models with these oscillations is you have to be able to measure the matter power spectrum to uh, percent level precision at very high redshift, specifically said larger than 15-ish. As you can see, for the equivalent of the very low mass uh, warm dark matter model, the difference between interacting and warm it's very dramatic at these high redshifts, where it's a bit smaller uh, when you have the weaker interactions and smaller uh, or and larger warm dark matter masses. But if you can obtain percent level measurements of the matter power spectrum at high redshifts, it is possible to distinguish these. Alternative probes of such an um, suppression of the uh, structure formation is in the halo mass function. If you have this type of interaction that prevents structure from forming, then you get fewer structures below a specific scale, namely the diffusion scale set by the collision uh, mean free path of these uh, interacting particles and when this uh, interaction decouples. So what we find is that we can, uh, to a good approximation, uh, fit a function to these uh, suppressions that is parameterized in terms of this uh, fitting function where M10 is the mass uh, within a sphere corresponding to the K where the matter power spectrum is suppressed by 10%. And we fit that uh, alpha works best as 0.9. And this uh, fitting function works roughly as well as other leading fitting functions to the suppression of the halo mass function. What can we use this halo mass function for? So these dark matter halos are maybe a bit hard to see, but luckily for us, often they will host galaxies. And we run these uh, galaxy formation models on the halo mass functions uh, we get from our interacting model. And what we see is that for interaction strengths, around 10 to the minus seven and smaller, 
we more or less are able to reconstruct the uh, galaxy population as we observe it. However, with 10 to the minus six and larger, we are not able to tune the galaxy formation parameters. So we get the observed uh, galaxy densities and thus we are actually able to already rule out the best fit by Hooper and Luca, at least tentatively from galaxy data. We, I'm also going to talk a little bit about a novel probe that we have used or will use to be able to constrain this uh, structure uh, or lack of structure from interactions, but could equally well apply to warm dark matter, for instance. So when we suppress our structure formation at small scales, we uh, develop fewer halos as we showed earlier. This in turn means fewer galaxies uh, because there are fewer halos in which these galaxies can form and showed. And that means less star formation because there's fewer places to form stars. This finally means that when there's fewer stars, there's, they form fewer black holes at the end of their lives and thus fewer black hole binaries. And these binaries uh, will merge after some time and we are able to observe these as has been done by LIGO, Virgo, Cagra. But if we suppress the number of these stars that form these black, black hole binaries, then we will see less mergers. And this could be a probe of the suppression of structure formation. So using these uh, galaxy evolution calculations, we feed this further into a uh, code that can help us calculate the number of gravitational wave binary events. So we use a code called COMPASS, which is publicly available. This uh, allows us to, from the cosmic star formation rate, compute the uh, binary black hole merger rate. And as we can see for interaction models, we see uh, less binary events, especially at high redshifts, though all, all the models are actually currently compatible with LIGO Virgo Kagra data. However, luckily for us, we're going to build more gravitational wave observatories. So when we look at our forecasts for observing with one year of Einstein telescope, once that becomes online, we see that we actually, we should be able to probe the uh, binary black hole rate out to very high redshifts because these new telescopes will be so sensitive. And that will allow us to put very strong constraints on this interacting model and thus also other models that affect structure formation by suppressing small scale structure. Because this has some caveats in that it's based on the specific astrophysical parameters that we put into our code uh, gal form to compute the galaxy populations as well as the parameters in uh, compass, but the we've used some fairly standard values and uh, with time, which is necessary to complete the observatories anyway, we hope that these uh, astrophysical parameters will also be better constrained. So in such, we are showing that this could be a very useful probe in the future. So I ha we have three key takeaways, essentially. Interacting with dark matter looks very much like warm dark matter at late times because the characteristic uh, oscillations imprinted get washed out. So in order to be able to, dis but this luckily means that we can use the same constraints for both, essentially. This means also that we need to get high precision data at very high redshift if we want to 
measure what the uh, may, uh, distinguish between warm dark matter and interacting dark matter models. Finally, we believe that the binary black hole merger rate, uh, as it can be observed by future uh, gravitational wave observatories, can be used as new and interesting probe of models that suppress this type of small scale structure. Thank you all very much for listening to me, and I will be happy to answer your questions in the discussion session. Hopefully, you will also be able to access these papers either when you are hearing this video or very, very soon thereafter. <laughs>